Hey, welcome to the shop. I'm gonna show you the recipe to get a really nice stick weld. I've been doing a lot more of my own food preparation lately with restaurant prices being ridiculously high and trying to eat a little healthier. And I've realized that even though I am by no means a professional chef, I'm able to get a pretty good meal out with the right recipe and stick welding is no different. If you get each of the ingredients right, it's gonna come out just right. Today we're looking at the big picture. If you wanna dive deeper into any of these uh, different aspects, I'll link some YouTube videos that I've made where I dive into each of them quite a bit deeper down in the description. And I'll also put a link to my online course where it's really comprehensive walking through each of these aspects with some exercises to get hands-on experience. Let's go ahead and dive into the first ingredient, which is selecting the right electrode for your application. Now, welding electrodes have a center core made out of steel, at least if you're using a steel electrode, which most of us are, and the outside coating is made out of flux. And the flux is designed to do a couple of things. One, to protect the molten metal from the atmosphere and the air to where it could get contaminated. Also, it controls the way that the electrode actually runs. They run quite a bit different between the different types. Now, the type that I like to use is a 7018, and in particular, a 3/30 seconds of an inch. That's the diameter of this center core. 7018 is used a lot in industry when you're welding on higher strength steels or thicker sections to avoid certain types of cracking. The reason I use it though is because it gives me a nice smooth bead all the way along, and it's really easy to read the puddle and tell that everything is running well. Let me go ahead and gear up and then we can run a weld with this and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now as I'm welding, you can see there's the weld puddle and behind it there's a C-shaped line with slag that covers over the top. So you can see how that lays in nice and smooth. Now 7018 isn't the right pick for everybody in every application. Some other electrodes you might look at are a 6010 or 6011. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna penetrate in really deep. And even though you don't get as smooth of a bead appearance, you can get a nice full penetration weld with a bit of practice and also cut through a little bit of dirt and rust that some of the other electrodes can't tolerate as well. The last one that's really common is a 6013. It's available around the world and it gives a nice smooth appearance similar to a 7018. It's a general purpose electrode. They aren't my favorite to run, but they aren't a bad choice either. Now, as far as the size of electrode to use, that's gonna depend quite a bit on the material thickness you're welding. And I'm gonna show you a chart in the next section, which will give you a recommended electrode size for different thicknesses of material. So the next ingredient is amperage and your welding amperage is dependent mostly on the type and size of electrode that you're running. And here's that chart. So you can grab a screenshot of this to know what amperage range you'll generally be in. Now this chart gives you most of the story, but uh, where do you sit within that range? Well, it depends on a few things. One, it depends on your material thickness. If it's thinner, you'll be a little bit lower in the range. Another common thing that it depends on is your welding position. If you're welding vertically up, then you're going to need to also be about 10% lower than you would be if you're welding flat. Now, I think the best way to really dial in what your amperage setting should be is to run a little experiment and run a bead, turn up the amperage a little and run another one. So that's what we're gonna do. I think that's a lot better, especially as a beginner than just trying to turn knobs as you weld on your project and make a mess all along the way. So I'm starting off at 70 amps here with this 3 seconds of an inch, 70, 18, and we'll see how it runs. Now, if you noticed at the end of my weld, I whipped that electrode out pretty quickly and that's gonna fling any slag that I have off the end there. So it'll make it a little easier to relight. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it up to 80 amps and run the next bead. So I'm gonna turn it up to 90 amps here. And I think this will be a little bit too hot for this material thickness with this electrode. Now 
Now I'm looking at each of these three welds that I ran here and the 70 amp weld looks pretty nice. I would actually like it to sit a little bit flatter, not to uh, heap up quite so high. And that's what I'm getting with 80 amps here. So that's where I'm gonna wanna run. At 90 amps, it was just a bit hot when I was trying to run it to be able to control that. Now I'm sure some heat did build in this, so it exaggerated the effect of turning up the amperage a little bit, but that's usually not too big of a deal when you're just trying to get a setting right. And the next three ingredients have to do with your welding technique, and these are gonna make 90% of the difference for most people. The first one is your arc length. That's how far is the end of your welding electrode away from your metal plate. And when you're welding, it can be hard to do that because this electrode obviously burns off, it melts away as you go. So you have to not only be moving along, you need to move in and some body positioning or propping, however you can is helpful for that. But let me go ahead and run a bead here just to demonstrate the difference between having a long arc and a nice short arc, which is what you'll usually want is to keep your arc length really, really short. So take a look at the difference here between those. Here with that long arc, it's just putting metal wherever it can all over the place. When I move in nice and close and tight like that, everything runs a whole lot better. As I look at this weld, it's just really lumpy and clumpy up here where I had that long arc length. You could tell that it just wasn't in control. And over here where I moved in tighter, it ran really well. And the next ingredient we'll talk about is your rod angle. And there's actually a force, an arc force that comes off the end of the rod here. And you wanna use that to your advantage, especially to push some of that slag, which is what the flux turns into back behind your weld puddle. That's what we've been chipping off here is that slag. And so it's good to be able to drag it. Now, when I'm looking at my angle in the direction of travel like this, this is called your travel angle. And you want that to be pointing backwards whenever you're welding in this position. Now, if you are welding vertically up, you'll be closer to in and out of the plate and maybe pushing it up a little bit because you have gravity to help with the slag. That's the one exception, but typically with slag, you'll want to drag. Now, if I turn the weld 90 degrees looking straight in and out of it, then this is my work angle. That's how it's angled relative to the work pieces. And here with a butt joint between two, I'd be straight in and out of it or with a T-joint, I'd be coming in and out at 45 degrees. So you wanna keep an eye on all of those angles. If those get too far out of whack, it can cause your weld to melt out and not fill in on one side or cause it to be off center or some things like that. Now the last thing we'll talk about is travel speed, how fast you're moving, and that's gonna control the size of your weld. Now I'll just run an example where I weld too fast then weld at what a typical speed would be, and then weld a little bit slow. And you can see the difference between these different segments. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. So here where I was welding too fast, the bead is really quite small. Over here where I was running a typical speed, that is the size of bead that I'd like to have, at least on this thickness of plate. And you can see how it's larger after uh, there towards the end. So in order to size your weld, just keep an eye on the size of the puddle because your puddle is gonna become your weld all the way along and you can make adjustments to your travel speed to make that larger or smaller. All right, let's go ahead and summarize this recipe. First of all, use the right type and size of electrode for whatever you're welding. Keep an eye on your amperage and run an experiment or a test weld and that'll help you get this dialed in. Next, we're talking about technique with these last three ingredients. Keep an eye on your arc length, keep it nice and short. Don't let it get long and out of control. Watch your angles to make sure that you're pushing that slag back behind your weld and keeping your weld pool coming in evenly into the joint. And finally, watch your travel speed to make sure that you're getting the size of weld that you want. 
So if you have all of these things right, then you're gonna be able to get a great weld out of this. Now, if you wanna dive deeper into any of these topics, I've linked YouTube videos about each one of them where I go in more depth down in the description, as well as my comprehensive online course where we have lessons about all these things and many, many more topics where you can learn about them and have a specific practice exercise to get it dialed in, walking through the process to where you can be able to confidently approach whatever you wanna weld um, without having to worry about it and just be able to do it. So check those out if you think they might be helpful for you. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, weld safely and we'll see you then.